When I was 10 years old, the only thing I wanted for my birthday, the only thing I wanted in life, was a boxed copy of Doom 2. Never mind that the game had been out for years at that point, I was fascinated by it, and I would not be deterred. On my birthday, my parents were shocked to find that I had actually received it, having agreed between the two of them that the game was brain rot trash and extremely not for children, yet some sympathetic soul in the outer family had gone and gotten it for me anyway. It took a week for my parents to decide whether I could keep Doom 2 or not, a week in which the box sat, mockingly, on a shelf in the living room. For a week, I stared at the box art and read the back cover and conjured up in my mind a game that could not, would not, ever actually be Doom 2. Hell on Earth, the demon invasion complete. Demons and shotguns and burning cities and miles and piles of guts, just guts from ceilings to floors. After a week, I got to keep and did play Doom 2, but it was Doom 2, and I had quietly filed that seven-day-long fantasy under Never Gonna Happen, where it had stayed until last week when it was published for PS4, Xbox One, and Windows under the title Doom Eternal. The Doom 2016 reboot was an amazing game, especially amazing for how robustly and cleverly it updated the core sensations and impressions of the original Doom more than any particularly deep mechanical legacy. It felt modern. It wanted to come across that way, an update, a progression in the franchise. Doom Eternal rejects that ambition completely. It's decided that Doom is a franchise whose opportunity and identity isn't in evolving and progressing, but in tactically regressing to provide tonal and mechanical experiences that modern gaming has tried to move beyond. Take Wolfenstein's rebooted titles. With the deliberate exceptions of the Old Blood and Young Blood, they've tried to create a world more vivid, real, and grounded in character than any of the source games. Doom 2016's self-aware nonsense plot was already a pivot away from that, but its meta-commentary on 1994's Doom as a cultural object positioned the 2016 game as something necessarily next-gen on top of that, something more refined, built off the original game's foundation. Not Doom Eternal. Not at all. Doom Eternal is exactly down to every detail. Not only the game I imagined Doom 2 to be when I was 10, Doom Eternal's design priorities and presentational choices are exactly in line with what 10-year-old me would have wanted the most back then. Doom Eternal has an obsessional relationship with its lore and coming up with the most baroque nonsense it can to pad out its codex. It's got a difficulty system that goes all the way from extremely forgiving to sadistically cruel, but it mitigates that with prominently featured cheats you can use to just fuck around and see all the shit you want to in a level. Its entire structure, from core loop to cutscenes, is meant to make you feel like an unbelievable badass no matter what. Doom Eternal is at once one of the most gory games I've ever played and the one in which that gore is the most cartoonish, the least impactful. If all flesh is grass, here in Doom Eternal, all guts are confetti. I don't necessarily disagree with Doom Eternal being an M for Mature title, but I do find it extremely ironic because I don't think I've ever played a modern reboot of a childhood title that ever put me in touch so vividly, so absolutely, with the child I used to be. Doom 2016 made a lot of concessions to me being older, to seeming respectable in some way, even in its irreverence. Eternal laughs in the face of the idea that it has to justify any of its excesses. Excess and indulgence are its only true passions. Its tonality is pure arcade as opposed to the ironic, half-serious level design and progression of the 2016 game. While this might make for a strange sequel, it's done an even better job than the last game of calcifying the image Doom wants to project for the franchise in 2020. Doom was the first. The first shooter to hit the broader pop culture and the first shooter to define its look and feel. Doom has abided by the passage of years, sometimes a console shooter when that was barely a thing, sometimes a slower-paced horror experience, sometimes a defiant return to ripping and tearing. Doom also wants to be the last. If the industry is pivoting towards open worlds, battle royale, and loot grinding, Doom will still be Doom, a linear game of simple verbs and classic circumstances. There will always be a space marine, there will always be demons. All those guts have to end up somewhere. Design trends come and go, but Doom... Doom is eternal. Ironically, though, it's best to look outside of the Doom franchise for an immediate comparison. The game Doom Eternal follows up more than even Doom 2016 is actually God of War 3. God of War 3 was a high-definition, console-defining title that pushed its hardware to the edge to provide the bloodiest, gnarliest action it could possibly render. The game was performatively cruel, indulgently grotesque, which was great, in a way. It was grindhouse experience presented with a kind of budget and scale that Hollywood rarely puts into stuff that hinges entirely on melodramatic camp and unrelenting gore. It was kind of an apex experience for that whole era in gaming of self-conscious edge. And then, a lot of years passed, and those of us growing up with the medium lived a lot of life. We changed. The developers of our games changed. And so when God of War was rebooted for the PS4, it no longer wanted to be the game that God of War 3 was. 
The new Tomb Raider similarly moved away from their schlockier roots, which reached their own apex in Angel of Darkness. The new Wolfensteins, of course. Duke Nukem didn't change much for Duke Nukem Forever, but the game's jokes were dated before it was even released, and its reputation is down there with Aliens Colonial Marines in terms of instant, unanimous loathing. There's been a sense for a long time in game design that if you stare too deeply into the 90s, the 90s will also stare back into you. Games like Dusk have been very successful in their niches, but as a general rule of thumb, a AAA reboot looks forward, like even Doom 2016 did. Doom Eternal is unabashedly regressive, but in a very tactical, considered way. It's homed in on what's kind of inarguably a true fact, if you think about it. There hasn't been a major release that feels like God of War 3, since God of War 3. Whether you agree with the pivot or not, there's been no big money game with that blend of operatically delivered, blood-soaked mythic melodrama mixed with aggression-driven combat rhythms, a mix where cruelty is doubly rewarded in play and story both. Doom Eternal has moved in to fill that gap so completely, so inarguably, that you couldn't even have another game like it come out in the next five years without provoking inevitable comparisons back to Doom Eternal now. It does what God of War 3 did in every way, except better, faster, more. It's even sillier than God of War 3, so the incredible level of gore comes across as more carefree, more joyful. Like, take a look at how all the enemies lose chunks of themselves as they take damage here in Doom Eternal. The last time a game gave this much of a damn about hitbox deformation might just be Soldier of Fortune 2, and the effect is just about as realistic. It's arcadey to the extreme, but provides hugely satisfying feedback about how close an enemy is to death without needing health bars. Doom 2016 didn't care about realism, but it made an effort to present a casually believable aesthetic. Eternal does not. It wants you to know, it knows, you know, it's a video game, in many more ways and for many more reasons than the previous Doom. In the end, I think Doom Eternal is the better game for it. The biggest immediate change to game feel is how the combat loop's been structured and stylized compared to Doom 2016. It's taken the idea that the new Doom's combat is principally about resource management and dialed that up to 11, with a whole new host of systems beyond the glory kill loop, designed to make combat a more deliberate numbers game than before. That restructuring mostly hinges on a controversial reduction in how much ammunition you can carry. At the 2016 game, the chainsaw was used as a last resort power weapon to make enemies burst with ammunition when you cleaved them, gushing ammo in an arc right along with the gore. It was an important, but occasional tool, one you could save up for a while to saw apart the bigger demons. There was enough ammo in your inventory and on the ground, generally, to get through any given combat encounter in Doom 2016. Eternal caps you at 16 shotgun shells and 40 bullets to start. It's not uncommon early on, and even throughout the game, to completely run out of ammunition for all of your guns two or three times during a single combat encounter. The chainsaw, then, now regenerates its first of three fuel units, so it's always an option for you. The normal FPS loop for this kind of game of pickups and power-ups is that if you need something, you'll find it on the ground. That's still true to a certain extent, but Eternal does with ammunition what Doom 2016 did with health. What you find on the ground is supplemental to what you're rewarded with by aggressive play, by ripping and tearing with the greatest abandon. It takes some getting used to, but I have to admit, it's an improvement. You're unable to play favorites with your weapons. Each of them have a particular utility, but the extremely low ammo cap means that it's likely that utility won't be available every time you want to use it. Enemies are designed a little differently too, with weak spots and specific counters that the weapons and weapon mods are meant to act as. Most satisfying and hilarious, for example, is how a grenade from the basic shotgun secondary fire can be lobbed into a floating cockademon's mouth where it'll swallow the grenade and blow out their stomach, immediately allowing a glory kill while they float there looking comically nauseous. It's a joke, and a valuable tactic both. It's even enjoyable as both an extreme repetition. Sometimes it's a more annoying thing, though, like overloading shields with a plasma rifle or breaking off armor with a blood punch. Either way, there is an ideal way to make your kills, and the low ammunition count satisfyingly destabilizes your ability to make those counters. With one notable exception I'll bring up a bit later, there's more than one way to skin an imp for every enemy, and you can kill everything in ways that aren't technically the ideal way. It's just harder and takes longer. It takes more concentration and more resources. 
If Eternal was just about pulling out each counterweapon for each enemy type, it would be rigid and boring. Instead, these are more of ideal suggestions for how to kill things the quickest, with the ammunition caps creatively, chaotically, interfering with your ability to do that, so that you have to improvise and kill things in ways and with tools that you never quite expected to. Having to get in close for periodic chainsaw kills helps with the rhythm, keeps the flow going, and forces the tactical choice of whether to kill many smaller enemies for a lot of ammunition, or to save fuel for to saw the big fellas in half in an emergency. On top of this, the game adds the Flame Belch ability, which does some light damage over time and shears off armor points for you to collect. In every way, Doom Eternal's loops demand that you take what you need and not just collect what's offered. The glory kill system for health, chainsaw for ammunition, flame belch for armor options means that once you have all of these options, there is no number that you don't have some control over making go back up if it comes down. It can feel like too much to manage from time to time, and the simplicity of the 2016 game's loop by comparison does make that older title feel a little bit more like a pure Doom experience. Eternal's complications and expansions, though, give it a more unique identity and rhythm. The playstyle you have to adopt to not only crush your enemies, to, but to mercilessly juggle them with violent abilities to take what they have ensures that no player is breaking character from the singularly homicidal role of the Doomslayer. To feel like a badass in this game, you must behave like one, or else die with no ammunition in a corner. This has led to some complaints when you add in the specific ideal enemy weapon combos that the game is too fundamentally inflexible and demands one specific rhythm. I found this to be untrue. It's actually very, very flexible in how you approach combat from a strategic and tactical perspective. You don't have to follow the tutorial ad advice to the letter every time. Like, I never even got the sniper rifle mod for the heavy rifle that features so heavily in the tutorials because I like the mini missiles, and I knew for a fact that I'd never remembered to actually switch from one mod to another. To make up for this, I just laid down extra hurt from the rest of the arsenal. Damage is damage. The tutorials are shortcuts and suggestions, they are not demands. The only point of true inflexibility is that it requires a singular attitude. Rip and tear. More controversial than the ammunition rebalance, for me, is the addition of dash and wall climb mechanics. They have fundamentally changed how the map design feels in a way that's both a little more complex and a little more anonymous. Doom 2016's steel corridors and dank hellscapes weren't nearly as visually impressive or dynamic as the levels in Doom Eternal, but they were more instantly recognizable as a Doom map, for the most part. That's not universally true with Doom Eternal. I want to give special credit to the very first map, Hell on Earth, for being an incredible tribute to the art of Doom 2. The holes you start out in, the way it magnificently transitions from those familiar, satanically decorated corridors to the burning cityscape, it is everything I ever wanted from a loose remake of Doom 2. This dedication to replicating the vibe and style of original Doom wall textures, overdoing something more naturalistic, is phenomenal. The level itself is massive and sprawling, starting at a tempo much faster and more brutal than the previous game, and escalating much, much faster from there. The pace and scale of combat by the end of the very first level in Doom Eternal feels more chaotic and intense than the 2016 game was at the halfway mark through the campaign, and it only goes up from there. There is so much to compliment here with Hell on Earth and Doom Eternal, like how they've kept the kind of oppressively vague feel of the cityscape from Doom 2. There were only a few levels there in Doom 2 that tried to create an urban feel, and they were like a series of dreary monoliths more than real buildings. Here, the ruined city is just shapes and impressions too, no billboards or brands, just a kind of dream city of concrete, fire, blood, and the occasional pop of neon that doesn't mean anything. There's no environmental storytelling, there's no world building, it's just a labyrinth of murder in the vague shape of a burning city. Doomsdale. You begin the game with a shotgun and a double jump. The feel of moving and shooting is powerful and dangerous from the get-go. The pistol, the poor neglected pistol, was completely cut beyond a console command line because it simply fell below the baseline of chunkiness for how the combat should feel. The shotgun rhythm is so much more important to Doom anyway. That specific input, sound effect, animation, input interval is burned deeply into the memory of anyone who spent a lot of time with the original games. The first level of Doom Eternal is a distillation of the entire franchise's intention, aesthetic, and rhythm. All in a little under an hour if you're poking your nose around for the secrets. There's no dash yet, not really any significant platforming. That changes the next level. 
Exaltia is a level that takes place on a ruined high fantasy world. You go and you receive exposition from the ghost of a king, who's also, I guess, the narrator. You leap from tower to tower and dash jump from monkey bar to monkey bar in tricky platforming challenges. All around you are collapsed domes and sci-fi-ish castles. On a dime, the aesthetic and navigation has pivoted from something that could not be anything but doom to somewhere that looks like Kroll and some one that feels like Kratos. The weird video game physics of the double jump, double dash platforming style fit in well enough with the general arcade feel, but they also fall below that same chunkiness threshold that I feel led to the pistol being cut. They're fine, I get why these mechanics are there, but it doesn't feel like Doom, and Doom is supposed to be this defiant throwback title, so why dilute the feeling? They change how the secrets are arranged especially, these mechanics. In Doom 2016, there were a lot of secrets that just completely eluded me. I saw the little question marks on the map, but the puzzle of how to get there was truly a puzzle for me. In Doom Eternal, I 100%ed the secrets. They're not very secret at all. The solutions to finding them are much, much more straightforward than Doom 2016, certainly more straightforward than earlier Dooms, but also much more technical, requiring perfectly timed leaps and perfectly rationed mid-air dashes. Instead of wandering wandering around, wondering how the hell here connected to there, I knew quite well. I just kept missing the jump and having to try again. You're not even penalized anymore for falling off the map, which is a kindness, but the necessity of that quality of life concession tells you a lot about how the level design has become more about open space than labyrinthine space. This is what got me going on the God of War 3 comparison in the first place, because the way I looked for these secrets and solutions for and the solutions for finding the secrets in Doom Eternal were closer to the way I found hidden chests in God of War 3 than it was to finding Doom 2016 secrets. You just have to identify the obvious path, track any allowable deviations from it, look for any bonus interactables, and interact. Very few of the listen for the distant door or press use on this suspicious wall texture kind of secrets that I associate with Doom. These shifts in player navigation and environmental assumptions are minor compared to the intensity of the core combat loop and do little to derail it. But it's shocking to play the first hour of the game, perfect and loving in its self-nostalgia, and then to play the second hour, where you could be anywhere from God of War to Gears of War. Doom Eternal's levels are incredibly varied, and even Exultia doesn't stick with the high sci fantasy its entire duration, but the effect of those two levels paired at the very beginning of this game caused some real whiplash for me. Does Dash's combat utility make up for the alterations made to the level design to accommodate it? I don't actually know. I didn't like to use it and dial down the difficulty instead of adapting to its growing necessity after a while. Doom Eternal's variable difficulties and its approach to challenge is one of the most genuinely accommodating I've ever seen in a AAA shooter. Doom Eternal, like Doom 2016, is a shooter defined by rhythm more than anything else. Unlike Doom 2016, you're punished quite severely for being offbeat on the higher difficulties. If this is a dance, you are supposed to lead, or else do -si do your guts off the floor and back to the checkpoint. The thing is, the pace of the game really can get overwhelming, and if you're trying to burn through it all quickly like I have been, extremely exhausting. You can change the difficulty up and down any time without penalty, which I found myself doing pretty often, mostly by rule of three. If I die three times in a single spot, I drop the difficulty to move on and then up again when I feel like it. There's a feeling that Doom Eternal wants to create, and that feeling is like surfing a wave of violence, right in the curl, the rush of sound all around you, the threat of collapse always above you, the threat of wipeout always below, narrowly skating by on an ever-moving knife's edge in between the two. This is, necessarily, different intensities to different people. The four difficulties provided are all about how wide of a knife's edge we're talking about here. For some people, the thrill is to be able to best all the hundreds on hundreds of demons knowing that death is only ever four hits away. It's that razor-thin margin for error, the cruel intolerance of the game towards missteps and mistakes that makes victory feel like victory to a lot of players. Doom Eternal is that game to those people. Its combat is so intricately interactive, so unpredictably demanding, that things like using dash during combat and proper weapon counters to enemy types do become absolutely mandatory on higher difficulties in certain situations. You have to keep perfect track of a dozen things at once. This is the rough surf, the big waves way out where the accidents happen and the feeling of mortality is most pronounced. That's where the skilled players ride inside the curl. To someone like me, on the higher difficulties, I see the shadow of the wave creep up and over me, think, ah, oh, fuck, and immediately get crushed underneath it. 
I can't hit that rhythm. The thing is, Doom Eternal is at its most fun when you're at your most desperate. When you have full health and ammo, that's fun for sure. But the grit and glory of combat is all in the moments where you've got a tiny red sliver of health left and suddenly a foe pops its colors indicating you can make a health refunding execution, then another, a chain of mayhem that takes you from zero back to hero and then down again. This is a lot of why the ammo count was reduced, to create more moments of panic and desperation. The adage about a cornered animal being the most vicious, that's actually a bedrock part of the combat loop in Doom Eternal. The right difficulty to play on is the one where you find those moments the most often. If you're getting worked over and over before you can make those spectacular recoveries, turn the difficulty down. If you don't remember the last time you died, turn the difficulty up. Depending on level and circumstance, that changes, but so does the difficulty if you take five seconds to swap it out in the menu. The game doesn't even give the slightest shit. It's actually more adaptive towards people who aren't good at the game than people who are. In addition to any time difficulty swaps, you can replay any level you've completed once with cheap modifiers you unlock through in-game exploration. Other collectibles and encounters you beat, even with the cheap modifiers on, are still added to your completion score. There has never been a modern Doom game that's been so generous in letting you just fuck around with it however you like. Even on easy, the late levels in the game are very challenging and apply a lot of pressure to the player. To the players riding those big waves way out, it might look unimpressive to see folks closer to shore, but the thing about it is, we're still doing it, farther away from the sense of impending death, but close enough to feel the spray on our skin and the roiling chaos under our feet. Doom Eternal's difficulty levels are variable enough to provide the same sensations to two players of roughly opposite skill levels. If keeping track of 12 things at once is too much, bump it down to a level where it'll forgive you if you forget a few. This is part of my surprise when people say the game is inflexible. In my experience, it bent over backwards to make me feel like a Doom Slayer, even when I was barely competent enough to rate as a Doom Stooge. There's one exception to nearly every single thing I've been talking about in terms of combat flow and adaptable difficulty, the turd in everybody's pool, the Marauder. The Marauder is an enemy type whose inclusion seems to have grown completely out of the decision to include the dash mechanic. The Marauder, when introduced, seems like a one-off boss monster. It would have been fine if that was the case. The Marauder is the one enemy where you pretty much have to abide by the tutorial. It has significant advantage over the player if they're too close or too far away. You're supposed to maintain a sweet spot of medium distance, wait for an attack animation, dodge, counterattack, then reset stance to perform again. The Marauder cannot be chainsawed, BFG'd, or otherwise taken off the board by a special weapon. Their shield is impenetrable to everything, and they are only vulnerable to splash damage until the prescribed moment for counterattack. It completely fucks with the way you might generally run massive, frantic circles around the whole combat arena. Now combat has to take place facing that enemy specifically, singularly focused, out of sync with the pace of all the other enemy attack rhythms. I said earlier that you're supposed to lead the dance in Doom Eternal. Well, the Marauder makes that roughly impossible. As a boss fight, this is great. It puts you at a significant initial disadvantage while you learn a new rhythm to kill him. He's an exotic change in mechanical pace and design assumptions. Exactly what a boss fight is meant to be. The problem is when Eternal starts layering the Marauder into the broader roster of enemies. When you toss a Marauder, or God forbid two, into a mix of regular enemies, you're forced to make an unpleasant, divisive, tactical choice. Ignore the high damage output Marauders, who have more powerful attacks the farther away you are from them, when you're not paying attention, or ignore all the other ten different ways the game is trying to kill you. This binary choice diminishes the fun of either option. If you try to kill everything else first, you're getting constantly backstabbed by an implacable, borderline invincible foe if you're trying to cause him just casual and incidental damage. Did I mention that he also summons a spectral dog to hunt you down and bite you? He sure does. Like the platforming you have to do to get to the secrets, it's not that defeating the Marauder is confusing or obtuse, it's that it requires patience, focus, and impeccable timing. If I whittle away all the other enemies first, I'll get him, for sure, but it could take me anywhere from one to three minutes of mistimed counterattacks and fumbled dodges. If I try to kill the Marauder as fast as I can before attending to the other enemies, there is an uncanny, unshakable sense that I'm waiting to go back to playing Doom. That if everyone will just be patient with me for a couple of minutes here and take a number, the Doom Slayer will be right with them. The argument I hear most often in favor of the Marauder as a regular roster enemy is that he is adding tactical value by requiring these equal loss propositions in terms of player attention that, like the ammo cap, he's a feature that doesn't do what the player wants it to, so it can instead do what the game needs to apply pressure in the right spots. 
it's pretty inarguable that they do force a player to be more strategic, more tactical. However, this is something that's only truly valuable to the surfers out on the far horizon. The Marauder runs counter to much of the mechanical tonality of the game, the values of the player's freedom of movement, and the verbs of violence. When you go back to the original Doom games, what's most striking is how absolutely minimal the interaction is. These games had 3D environments, but it was before mouse look, before gyro controls. These, there were six things you could do, and that's it. Forward, back, left, right, use, shoot. This was the game. It was enough. It is still enough. The games have aged in all the obvious ways, but none of the essential ones. The original Dooms are still engaging and exciting to play for all the same reasons they were bestsellers in 1994. The beauty of the combat loop in the new Doom games, what makes them so genius as remakes and reimaginings, is how they've preserved that sense of simplicity even in the face of ever more complicated game systems by focusing unerringly, unceasingly, on aggression. Aggression solves everything. You have a lot more than six inputs to go about pressing, but you aren't burdened with any extra intentions. Slay the enemies, find the items, ferret out the secrets, beat the level. Always forward, always bloodthirsty. Even in the now absurdly convoluted lore, this is how you're supposed to be. The Marauder forces you to play, instead, defensively, waiting to attack, observing, parrying. It's always a duel, even with others on the field. Doom isn't about any one enemy or encounter. It's about the labyrinth, the nightmare spiral of corridors, hidden rooms, infinite enemies. The Marauder, by himself, isn't a bad enemy. In fact, he's a standard kind of combat rhythm in other games. In Doom Eternal, though, he forces a player to break character. All it would have taken to close the gap is a weakness to the special weapons. Sure, make the shield impenetrable to anything, except the BFG or the Onmaker. Make him invulnerable to the chainsaw, sure. It is but a puny human weapon, after all. Just cut me a fucking break and make him vulnerable to the sword you get in the extreme late game. There's a classic scene in Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark where, during a chase, the scimitar-wielding badass bursts from the crowd and twirls his weapon, signaling his readiness for epic battle. So Indy just pulls out his revolver, guns the guy down, and keeps on going. It's not that the Marauder applies too much pressure to the player, it's that the player can't violently squirm out from under that pressure the same way you can with other enemies. You can't have that moment of completely denying the enemy. You have to have a sword fight with a man from the crowd every time, and can never just hilariously, satisfyingly slap it off the table. The Marauder wears pieces of the kind of armor the Doomslayer wears, a not-so-subtle indication that he's supposed to be as much of a threat as you are. To have him be more of a badass, the player's badassery must be temporarily mitigated. It's not bad combat design necessarily, it's just bad storytelling in a game whose real narrative is the trail of corpses and colored in map you leave behind. Doom Eternal has another narrative, the overproduced scripted one outside of the player's control. This plot seeks to coherently, concretely tie every Doom game together in one canonical chain and then meticulously explain background details and concepts that I never really expected or wanted the game to try and explain. Part of the original game's appeal, all the original id games really, was their unapologetic, overwhelming moods. Id shooters barely had a plot holding them together until Quake 2, a commitment to narrative they had abandoned again by Quake 3. Doom Eternal, though, has an ever-expanding codex which uses thousands on thousands of words to provide expository detail for everything from the demons to the skyboxes. My appreciation, though, for the original Doom's disregard for explaining itself is something I've come to as an adult. When I was younger, when I first popped the anti-theft tape off of that boxed copy of Doom 2 that had been taunting me for a week, the first thing I did was religiously inhale every single part of the user manual, all the single page of introductory scene setting, all the half a dozen pages of enemy and weapon descriptions. I felt deep in my little heart that this lore was incredibly important simply by virtue of its scarcity. Even then, the context of where I was and why in a game was very important to me. Thing is, I'm here in someone else's art dream to pick up on some complicated vibe and see if it resonates with me, is a where and a why that I could never really articulate then. It happened, I loved Doom for its art and its mood, even if I didn't have the words for why, but there was no way back then that a mood alone would have felt like enough for me. I wasn't alone. Consider the explosion in lore density between, say, Warcraft 1 and 2 or Diablo 1 and 2. The originals were lore minimal, just figuring out what kind of games they wanted to be. The sequels took each mechanic and circumstance and then colored in details as intricate as they were superfluous to understanding the general vibe. 
Doom Eternal, in trying to return to game design of the late 90s and early 2000s, has inherited one of its most dated conundrums, figuring out how to tell a story that complements the gameplay. The era Doom 1 and 2 came out in was not a narrative-heavy period for games. It was largely a time for pioneering the hows of digital interaction, the principles more than the presentations. In the late 90s, early 2000s, there was then an explosion of cutscene-driven exposition. The plot and presentation of Doom Eternal has exactly some of the same shortcomings and exactly the same feelings as cutscenes from that early, rougher era. A protagonist who awkwardly refuses to speak even when the camera breaks first person. Characters who exist solely to chew the scenery and confuse you with confidently delivered pulp sci-fi nonsense. An overabundance of color and verve and a famine of actual expository purpose beyond sequencing the levels. Doom Eternal is a great game if you never read the codex. It's the game it wants to be with no supplemental information. Yet it still provides you with reams and reams of it, all written seemingly with the understanding that it's all nonsense and bullshit anyway. The clearest example is the Human Resistance Radio DJ. Periodically, at the castle fortress in the sky you retire to between levels, there's a newsy update on all the killing you've been up to. You're referred to, variously, as the Doom Slayer, the Doom Marine, and Doom Guy. The writing here is casual, to the point of being borderline annoying. If you'd given me a spiral ring notebook and asked ten-year-old me to write a Doom 2 script during my fantasy week, it would have been like this. Reports from the ground suggest that this guy, the Doom guy, is both the coolest and the greatest. He's torn apart a big monster, but more big monsters remain. Listeners want to know, is there any limit to how much ass this Doom guy can kick? I realize part of the point is for this to be throwback dialogue as well. Meaninglessly silly like video game stories used to be, but it feels performative and passionless. It's different when a game that came out before it could present a story naturally used absurdity and nonsense to structure its progression of levels than when a game comes along that could either omit or surpass those absurdities, yet chooses to half-ass it instead because it thinks that half-assing is part of the nostalgia. Take the Quake series. Quake 1 has an art style and a soundscape that is still so unique as to be instantly identifiable. It's more classic in a certain way than Quake 2. Yet Quake 2 is the more structured, comprehensible experience because of its narrative. It flows in a way that Quake 1 does not. Quake 3 and 4 followed up on these threads separately. Quake 3 Arena was built for deathmatch, and only deathmatch. Its arena configurations, power-up distribution, and player speed are a well that Doom Eternal drinks from deeply. Like Quake 1, it's only about rhythm and the aesthetic. It's a mood piece. Quake 4, like Doom 3, pivoted towards a slower-paced, more cinematic presentation, and as a consequence, lost touch with many of the mechanical signifiers of the games that it followed up. For all that sacrifice of game feel, of the arcade look and motion of Quake 3, Quake 4 was also hugely effective at being military sci-fi in a more traditional way. Its story, and story presentation, is superior to anything in Doom Eternal. The confident move would have been, Quake 3 style, to cut out the appendix before it bursts if you know in advance that your storytelling is going to be done primarily through mood and movement. Instead, Doom Eternal clings to a bloated and meandering narrative that gets delivered without passion or purpose. In Doom 2016, Doom Guy's character was conveyed with a, dis a disdain for exposition, a refusal to consent to the story being told. It was a narrative arc that the Doom Guy took right off the wall and hammered flat into a straight line from him to his goal. That was the joke. Doom Eternal is so committed to nostalgic reverence that it won't risk that. It's unwilling to suggest its mythology doesn't matter because it's woven the player into that myth, and now suggesting that the Doom Guy isn't to be taken seriously is to suggest the same of the player. The player is supposed to feel like the Doom Slayer, the ultimate badass, and if the whole narrative has come to rely on the idea that you're cool and special, then this brown nosing becomes complicated if the player character reflexively rejects all of it, like they did in the less re self referential plot of the 2016 game. The player is the center of the universe in this game, so in the cutscenes, you just have to stand there and let it revolve around you. This entire messiness can actually be condensed and illustrated using the Fortress of Doom, your castle in the sky space base. 
It's a hub to anchor and track your progression, not so much across the narrative, but across the many branches of the overabundant upgrade trees. You collect coins from ghosts to get suit upgrades, unlock those little flying drones for weapon mods, receive weapon upgrade points from combat and exploration, and also collect keys to unlock an alternative to the BFG based on a super weapon from Doom 64. If you complete optional challenges in a level, you also receive a bonus Sentinel battery collectible, which you can use to unlock all sorts of points and bonus costumes for your Doom guy and the locked rooms aboard the fortress. Most of these currencies are scattered around levels as hidden objects. Not too hidden, of course. But the fortress is where those upgrades and collectibles are redeemed and displayed. The prize booth at the center of the arcade where you go to do something with the fistfuls of tickets that the game spits out. There's even a free practice arena for testing out items and strategies, though why you wouldn't want to just go hog wild out in the field as the new weapons come up is kind of beyond me. To get enough Sentinel batteries to unlock all the side rooms, you have to complete every bonus challenge for every level. It's not important to do so, but it provides some kind of completion of satisfaction for whoever they can sucker into caring about getting three different glory kills on an airborne enemy over the course of a single level. More than the overwritten and underperformed script, Doom Eternal shows the cynical side of its nostalgia in the moments when you're not ripping and tearing. For all its effort making itself out to be a defiant throwback and a return to form for pure single-player shooters, it has an entire layer of behavioralist bonus systems that serve no real purpose other than to coerce some players into spending extra time checklisting things within the game. The modern ethos of games as service is fundamentally opposed to the way that Doom was released, as shareware, a title where the first chapter is free because they know that people will like it enough to come back for the whole thing. There's only one question that matters when it comes to replaying Doom, the simple question of did you like it enough to come back? Doom Eternal is a linear, single-player experience. There's no reason to come back every week and grind XP for Battle Pass rewards. If you liked it, you can do it again. If not, you paid your 60 bucks and that's that. It's hard for me to figure out why that isn't enough, why I'm supposed to feel more motivated to keep playing by a checklist of gameplay choices I find counterintuitive and annoying than I would be motivated by straightforward fondness for the game I just finished playing. I don't understand why I would invest twice as many hours into the game than I feel perfectly satisfied with for a new costume and a pedestal for my little digital Doom Slayer on the menu screen. This kind of design runs completely counter to the larger spirit of retro purity that the game truly wants to cultivate. The saving grace is that it's also largely superficial and incidental to how you'd be interacting with the game anyway, that successful participation in the collectathon requires barely any extra effort. There is a lot to checklist if you want to get intense about it, but if you don't seek it out, it doesn't make a fuss. You can even entirely miss the Doom Slayer's bedroom, the most potent distillation of how convoluted Doom Eternal's relationship with its protagonist has become. So, what does the Doom Slayer do in his downtime? Would it surprise you to know that he reads a fat stack of comic books and magazines on a throne, hangs heavy metal posters on the wall, and collects shelves full of colorful toys? Bet the Doom Slayer's room, with the exception of an armor workstation, is as consumeristically perfect as a Twitch streamer's background set? He's got the Doom 3 Soul Cube right on his desk. He's even got a big beige box 90s PC where you can play, you guessed it, Doom, creating a peculiarly disorienting mirrors facing each other sensation to experience Doom within Doom as the Doom guy. When the New Order incorporated classic Wolf 3D levels into the new game, they were presented as nightmares, strange dreams of mazes and war. For the Doom guy, all his travels, all his famous rage, all his violence amounts to little more than a collection of keepsakes, consumer products, and ironic reflection. This room reflects not the myth of the Doom Slayer, but the myth of the Doom Player. It's the room of a perfect franchise fan who is also the protagonist for whatever reason. So either he's his own biggest fan, or the game is unwilling to clearly draw a line between who the player and who the Doom guy are supposed to be, unable to articulate when it's talking about one or talking about the other. If the Doom guy were keeping character with how he was in the 2016 game, he wouldn't have the time of day for any of the narrative excesses in Doom Eternal. Yet he's not allowed to be flippant with the player's reverence for themselves and the franchise. There's only room in this medium for one self-worshipping 90s throwback action hero who sits on a big throne and reads articles about himself all day. Maybe it's been a while since we've seen the Duke, but that doesn't mean his whole shtick is up for grabs. What's next? Is the Doom guy gonna speak? Well, yeah, sure, but only, only, because it's the most absolutely direct way to incorporate that comic panel that we all love so dearly. 
The Doom comic, despite being 16 pages long and nearly 24 years old, despite most people having never seen a physical copy, despite it not even being a point of reference for people who aren't already franchise fans, it is the single defining document guiding who the Doom guy is supposed to be and how he's supposed to act. This is especially interesting because the comic's intention is basically to mock the simplicity of the conflict in Doom. The Doom guy here starts out under the influence of the Berserker pack, the power-up where you get one-hit melee kills with the punch, and that's what he's just happily doing, just tearing demons apart with his bare hands. He kicks down a door, knock knock, who's there? Me, 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 me. He sees the biggest demon in the game and declares in the middle of muttering to himself, you are huge. That means you have huge guts, rip and tear. That phrase, that attitude, is the absolute bedrock foundation of the whole mythology these two modern dooms have created. The whole glory kill system largely stems from his absurdist battle cry. It's not just that, either. A couple pages later, we have the line, Ah, the chainsaw, the great communicator. Allow me to communicate to you my desire to have your guns! A commandment which seems to have directly led to the chainsaw's ammo pinata mechanic in the new dooms. Or a couple pages later, this guy, with the absolute stupidest shit-eating grin the artist could possibly draw for him, he says, At this particular moment in time, I don't believe I have a healthier or more deeply felt respect for any object in the universe than this here shotgun. The heavy, meaty punch of the double barrel in the new dooms inspires the same damn feeling. To take what's just a simple human boomstick and crush hell's mightiest demons into paste with it provides a deep animal satisfaction that's hard to put a finger on. The doom guy in the comic's characterization is hilariously bizarre because he's not an idiot. Exactly. He's just gleefully single-minded and completely impulsive. There is no tactical bone in his body, just the urge to kill. Can't kill? Get gun. Still can't kill? Get bigger gun. Have biggest gun? That's best goodest. I think the reason that the comic resonated so damn much is how the frantic pace of Doom and the limited verbs of how you interact with the game world do turn the player into that person, that mindset. Rip and tear. Might makes light. The leap in logic, the leap in faith that had to happen to get us from there to here, is someone saw these irreverent, bizarre pages and thought to themselves, you know... We should spend many millions of dollars giving this man his own game. Before the comic, the Doom guy was just a blank slate, no personality beyond whatever the player is feeling, so the comic simply makes canonical the oddly casual bloodlust that the game's inspired. The comic is the hinge, more than any game, between past and future Dooms. No matter what changes in the greater design, however many bonus systems get added, however the level design shifts priorities from mazes to arenas, it will all still feel like Doom if you can get the players thinking how the Doom guy thinks in these 16 prophetic pages. Doom Eternal takes all the background lore from the 2016 game and maximizes it, expands on every single person and place even casually mentioned in the previous game's codex. None of that prepared me for a flashback a flashback in a Doom game, where the sci fantasy sentinel civilization holds in a stranger who appeared wandering the spaces between worlds, mumbling to himself. They toss a helmet down, the same helmet from Doom 64, where the Doom guy decided he would remain there forever in hell to fight the demons. He's mumbling to himself, Rip and tear. It's a lot. It's a lot to have the Doom guy speak. It's breaking a major franchise taboo. More than that, he never speaks outside of this flashback and remembered moment. So, what's important enough to break the taboo? Calling back to the only other time Doomguy famously spoke, which is in the comic. Having him deliver the line, the line we know, the line we love. The line that's defined an entire franchise and raked in money hand over fist. What began as a joke, which then became a meme, then became a statement of intent, then became the Doom's own gospel of game design, has now, finally, with Doom Eternal, been elevated to creation myth. In the beginning was the word... And the word was dynamite. There's another comic book character that Doom Eternal seems to take some significant inspiration from, and that's the Saint of Killers from the Preacher books. The Saint is an old Wild West gunslinger who died with his quest for vengeance unfulfilled. Years later, in hell, the Angel of Death is at a poker game when he gets this idea that he could effectively retire if this old angry soul was given power to reap souls. So they cast him two revolvers made from the swords of angels. Anything they hit dies. Anyone. So when the devil gives the gunslinger his weapons, the Saint of Killer guns the devil right the fuck down. 
His personality, his hatefulness, and his utter commitment to violence from the pit of his being on upwards mirrors the Doomslayer. In Doom Eternal, all this convoluted turning of lore across many cutscenes serves a relatively simple climactic revelation. Heaven is complicit in Hell's atrocities. A seemingly divine being, from the aliens on whom humans based angels, has masterminded the demonic invasion of Earth so that the souls who die and are tortured in the Hell dimension can provide pure, clean energy to perpetuate her own civilization, which is dimensionally opposite from Hell. You know, paradise. The pearly gates. The climax of the Saint of Killers subplot in Preacher is that, upon learning that God was the one who engineered the circumstances who turned him into the man he is, he launches a one-man assault on heaven itself. He kills the entire heavenly host. He kills God. And then he sleeps. Now, there was a man who was too good at his job, if there ever was one. Doom Eternal basically works the same way. The Doom Slayer is part of a vast cosmic cycle where he is destined to fight the demons forever, but never allowed to actually triumph because the cosmological system depends on the conflict. It's cruel. So is the Doom Slayer. The last run of three levels, through the soul factory of Necrovol, where Earth's dead are tortured until they decay into energy demonic husks, up to heaven, and then back to Earth's ruined cityscapes for a final boss, if they're all breathlessly exciting, and they do climax the game perfectly. I didn't care much for the high fantasy stuff because it felt so generic, but when I realized that this game was positioning itself to pull a saint of killers and have you take on both heaven and hell at the end, I forgave it all. Tonally, it's perfect. It's not a story of good versus evil. Not exactly. Never was. It was a story of man versus monster, and this universe they've made is full of monsters. It's a great way of addressing and diffusing the game's inclination to borrow religious imagery and ideas, to slightly reframe it all with extra sci-fi stuff so it never gets too Jesus-y or too saccharine. I was re-watching the 90s four-part TV version of The Stand recently, and I had somehow blocked out how bad the last two episodes are for just that reason. Good versus evil is a fine setup, but heaven versus hell can carry you away to a climax where the actual literal hand of a Christian god descends from above to detonate a nuclear weapon in Las Vegas. Even the out-of-control weird Doom novelizations had a flirtation with Mormonism in their own version of Hell on Earth. For all the scenery-chewing nonsense that Doom Eternal's story puts you through, it was actually quite clever about the broad strokes of where it was going and why. This final conflict feels perfect for what Doom is about, for how it wants to feel. Mythic, dark, violent, but also with a sly dose of manic joy, like a classic Iron Maiden album. It's layered with boss fights at the end. The con maker, the angel being, is an area of denial boss who must be fought with a specific kind of moveset, a kind of boss more obviously suited to third-person action titles and rhythms. I didn't like fighting her for all the same reasons I didn't care for the Marauder. The pace just felt off, and the movement restrictions felt awkward. This is, though, a loose remake of Doom 2, so the final boss has to be the Icon of Sin. In Doom 2, the final boss was basically a room and not an enemy. It was an odd boss fight, more puzzled than combat as you strode fire rockets into its brain in a game that didn't let you aim up. You had to be launched into the air to find an actual firing solution. That's what made him an icon. He was a living, antagonistic wall ornament. This iteration just makes him very large. Eight different body parts have to be destroyed in turn, twice over. And once you've destroyed a part, he stops taking damage in that hitbox. It can get a little confusing, but it's a much, much easier fight than the one with Con Maker. It's just a straightforward beatdown with the Icon of Sin. You'll kill him one little piece at a time, each bullet you fire into him ripping and tearing his flesh. Tactically, not as interesting as the Maker, viscerally, much more satisfying. Breathless escalation across 13 levels until it's no longer possible to escalate. Doom Eternal is a strange, busy game. None of that extraneous excess ever seems to be able to slow the momentum, though, of what the game is at its heart. A game of mazes, monsters, and mayhem. A game of aggression and dread. A Doom game. The classic setup of Space Marine versus the Demon Hordes will never stop being fun, so long as the battle feels like this game feels. Even if the structure is entirely different. To check this assumption against reality, we can take a quick dip 23 years into the past with Doom Eternal's pre-order bonus, a re-released version of 1997's Doom 64, to see what Doom felt like the very last time it looked and played like the original titles. Like a lot of people, it took years for me to pick up on the fact that Doom 64 is not just a port of Doom for the Nintendo 64, but a completely new game with completely new levels made exclusively for that system. It has slightly updated lighting effects, new sprites for all the monsters, and a few other small surprises. The biggest surprise is how high effort a production it was from Midway, its developer. 
Doom 64 has been kind of obscure ever since it was released. The Nintendo 64 didn't position itself at the time as quite as much of an all-ages platform as something like the Nintendo Switch, and so there wasn't an overwhelming overlap between the kind of people who would buy Nintendo 64 titles and the kind of people who were Doom fans. In the subculture, Doom has always been a PC-first experience. The original Doom was so ubiquitous on PCs that shooters, for a while, were called Doom clones in the sort of way that folks use the term Souls-like these days. In 1997, shooters on consoles were a major novelty, with titles like Perfect Dark leading the pack. These shooters were generally lighthearted in tone and colorful in design. Hardly any of those early console shooters were moody, dark, and mean. None of them were Doom. To port Doom to a console is a no-brainer, but it's still the game it had been in 1994. To actually craft a whole new Doom three years later for a Nintendo of all things was an unusually bold choice. More than that, Doom 64's campaign was never officially given a PC back release until now. All previous PC versions are reverse engineered by fans. It was stranded then on a platform where it was wildly out of step with the general aesthetic of the rest of the N64 titles. So why come back around to it now? There's the business novelty of releasing two Doom games for the price of one, made over two decades apart, both new to pretty much everybody. Beyond that, though, I think it's to underline what I found to be true in playing Doom 64 after playing Doom Eternal, that these games feel linked. There's a thread of art and design that they both follow. There's a feel of movement, of the impact of combat that they share. The core loops are massively different, the balance of everything is different, yet you can't deny that they both give the same active impression, that what was done with Eternal is a continuation of the work done with Doom 64. Doom 64 even brings the way the franchise evolved up into Doom 3 into a sharper focus. Let's first talk of the way it most resembles Doom 1 and 2, the level design. As focused as the new games are on secret areas and level interconnectivity, it isn't anything compared to how labyrinthine and obtuse the levels used to be. Much of this has to do with differences in technology. These days, game engines are powerful enough to make more or less any where or any when seem plausible. When level architecture defies visual logic and a casual inspection for believability in a modern game, it sticks out, it gets noticed. So there's been a slow shying away from major environmental abstractions as visual fidelity increases in the modern medium. Doom 1 and 2 didn't come from an era where that fidelity was possible at all. Their worlds are the barest minimum of 3D. Naturalism and believability are out of the question. What you have instead is geometry, shapes, and angles. Some different early games tried to hide that and mimic a kind of suggestive proto-naturalism, but Doom 1 and 2 went the opposite direction and embraced their abstractions. This is why Wolf 3D levels made so much sense as nightmares for the new Blazkowicz. They are dreamlike in how you have the objects of architecture, the hallways, the doors, the lights, but no definable purpose to any of it. Sure, in Doom, some are coherently themed like Mars Base or Ruined Downtown, but beyond a vague impression, there's nothing in those halls and chambers that makes concrete sense. When hell starts bleeding over into the sci-fi environments and things begin degrading into a satanic maze, this feels right, because the whole shape of the world had already felt wrong to begin with. Rhythmically, Doom 64 isn't quite based around combat encounters so much as it is key cards. Every single level has a collection order for these key cards, and sometimes tricky puzzles to solve to make use of them. Much of this environmental puzzling comes from a lack of a jump mechanic. You can run across gaps to mimic the effect of jumping, but if an object is above knee height in relation to your character, then you can never pick it up until you adjust its elevation somehow. So the game often lets you see what you need, where you need to go, and then hides how to get it and get there deeply and deviously. The often sprawling maps are segmented into more basic yellow, blue, and red paths so that the player can't really get lost exactly. There are never too many options for where you haven't been in relation to where you have. The sometimes paralyzing frustration of having too many leads to follow is mitigated by locked doors who unlock in an order that gently guides a player through a confusingly geometric space. Secrets in this game truly are secret. Only rarely will one be set along a path that's visible. These things are behind walls, false textures, or doors that open from obscure, usable objects many, many rooms away. Secrets are so important to Doom 64 that the final boss is made exponentially more difficult to defeat if you don't find three hidden objects in three hidden levels during the campaign. 
Doom 64's progression through the levels feels jankier than Doom 1 or 2, not because of any game design issue, but because the Nintendo 64's basic model never allowed you to actually save your game. Sure, some people bought the little cartridge you slapped into your controller to do it, but the game had to be produced with the understanding that making it through the 25 to 28 levels of the main campaign was A, beyond what could be done in, in an average sitting, and B, also beyond the hardware to maintain across multiple sittings. So, they created a feature that generates a personal, player-specific password for every level that tracks what health, armor, and ammo amounts you reach the exit with. It remembers if you found the hidden demon artifacts. If you die during level, however, you're pushed back to the beginning of that level with only a starting pistol. All of those artifacts go away if you die. It's halfway between regular progression and a permadeath run. The re-release has anytime saves on every platform, so it's not so much of an issue now. But death still feels somehow much more consequential than it did in the previous games. Doom 64 took the fact that the hardware of the system they're releasing the game on made mortality extra complicated to develop and leveraged that into part of the greater mood of the game. The soundtrack is much more ambient and pensive than before. The shadows are darker. The new designs for the enemies makes them look more aggressive. The movement speed is still inhumanly fast, and the sprites still have a certain cartoonishness to them, but make no mistake, Doom 64 leans farther towards horror than Doom 2 or the new Dooms did. It showed that Doom's design has two opposed directions it can go based on what the early titles were all about and how they felt. One is towards blood and guts mayhem, which the gameplay still prioritizes when you're not scratching your head over what switch unlocks which door. The narration slides in Doom 64 lean especially in this direction, towards a heavy metal vocabulary of brimstone, blood, and frenetic energy. This direction leans towards aggressive arcade play and a sense of mastery. The end of level tally for time spent, secrets found, monsters killed, items consumed, this is and always has been a key part of Doom, and the focal point for this aspect of the design attitude. Doom 64 also posits another direction, where all this winding darkness is allowed to be as oppressive and consumptive as it can, where environmental exploration and dread are the driving motivators, where the labyrinth has mastered you, and not the other way around. This second design attitude is exactly what you find at the at the core of Doom 3. Doom 3 is truly a fantastic horror shooter, yet it's controversial as a Doom game because of how it seemed to diverge from what came before. Doom 64 is the missing link between Doom 2 and Doom 3, and it's also the missing link between Doom 2 and Doom Eternal. Consider the role of the on-maker weapon in each. It's a laser cannon from hell itself that adds an extra laser beam for each demon symbol you find beyond the exits to the hidden levels these symbols are themselves hidden on are damn hard to access. The first requires guessing a four-digit code. The second requires jumping into a cliff wall off of a tiny pedestal shaped like an arrow. And the third involves running backwards across half the level to enter a door that opens only for a very short period of time when you reach the top of the staircase to the regular exit. Then, each secret level is, itself, long and difficult. If you die without reloading or re-entering a password, you'll lose all of these artifacts. In the final arena, though, you'll be able to simply turn off all three of the portals which send waves of high-level enemies into the room, and the mother of all demons just happens to be weak to the Onmaker's upgraded beams. In Doom Eternal, you get the Onmaker by beating all six Slayer Gates, challenge trials where you face down waves of demons in such numbers and such ferocious configurations that the fights pretty much have to be optional. Best them all, and you get a BFG replacement that chews up the icon of Sin Fight's enemies and even the big boy himself like they were fucking breakfast. Doom 64 demanded an environmental pathfinding effort, way beyond what was normally required of you to get the Onmaker. Doom Eternal demands a tribute by combat instead. Neither are wrong, both feel uniquely Doom, and each are united through the structured, purposeful reward of the Onmaker. One interesting, if likely to be overlooked thing about the re-release is that it comes with a new Lost Levels campaign for Doom 64, like the BFG edition of Doom 3 added its own bonus third campaign. It was teased as having an important plot connection to Doom Eternal, but that is not exactly true. At the end of Doom 64's main campaign, you defeat the Mother of All Demons and decide to remain in Hell to fight the Demon Menace forever. The Lost Levels are a six-level campaign that ends the exact same way, with the exact same slide, but phrased in a way that's more directly consistent with the Codex entry in Doom Eternal. So if you're thinking of laying down $5 for it just to get additional story, I'm sorry to tell you that the cereal box is empty on that one. 
The reason to play the Lost Levels is the same reason to play the rest of Doom 64, to feel the old rhythms and be immersed in the old textures. Despite being new content, the levels feel very in keeping with the older style of Labyrinth. There's only one level in the mars Bay style before pivoting to five different varieties of hell. However, the levels do have larger arena-like areas in the basic style of the newer Dooms. It's woven in with the traditional maze work and doesn't dominate the design, but these levels don't unlock until after you beat the original campaign for good reason. They escalate from the climactic intensity of the main campaign. There's a number of extremely tricky situations where it's easy to die so fast. It underlines a noteworthy point about the pace and intensity of the combat in Doom Eternal. It is certainly more punishing than the 2016 game, but is often actively less cruel than the original titles. When it comes to antagonistic, player-shredding design, there's nothing, not even in the new levels, to compare to the deep-secret levels of Doom 64. In the first level of the campaign, there are ten exploding barrels scattered around. If you leave the very first one intact and destroy the other nine, you can come back and destroy this final barrel by taking a shortcut through a secret teleporter. This tenth explosion will open up, in a room behind the one you began the game in, another secret teleporter. This takes you to Hectic, a ruthlessly vicious puzzle challenge. The level's tiny, four rooms. The initial room has power-ups you'll desperately need, but picking any up will kill you. The easiest room has a series of shifting floors leading to a key where arrows will shoot from the walls and deal tremendous damage if you're clumsy or unlucky. The second easiest room has you running across tiny posts above a lava pit that there is no way out of, surrounded by four Hell Knights who you have to rapidly defeat with a rocket launcher, knowing that your rocket launcher has kickback that can easily knock you off into the lava. You don't even get the launcher until you best the hardest of the three rooms, a confined space where you have to use that same rocket launcher with its devastating potential for self-injury at close range to quickly kill three arachnitrons with no room to actually dodge their dangerous salvos or yours. Each of these rooms will take massive chunks of your health away, and there is no way to get new health besides a single berserker pack that you can't actually reach the Hell Knights to use. It's just there to tempt you to try to make the jump so that you fall in the lava and die. Beating Hectic unlocks cheats for the game and a run of three other challenge levels. One, for example, is called Cat and Mouse, where it's just you, a maze, caged imps, and a giant, giant cyber demon. It's locked in on the highest difficulty, where killing the cyber demon takes dozens of rockets on your end, but him killing you takes two hits. It takes a real, true desire to rip and tear to want to try the challenge. But that's the spirit of Doom. When you play earlier Dooms, like Doom 64, all the ammo, all the health, is on the ground. You can easily get into situations where you do have to play cautiously, defensively, where cat and mouse is the name of the game. If Doom Eternal has left anything completely behind from the early games, it's that the game has eliminated situations where you're put on the defensive like that. Anything you need in Doom Eternal, health, ammo, armor, just take it. Any monster will yield any resource. You just have to fuck them up the right way. In this way, the newer games are purer in the spirit of their intent, even where they're more convoluted in their systems and presentation. What's remarkable about the Doom franchise is that, taken all together, every last one of them belongs together. Every last one of them is instantly recognizable as a Doom game. The details differ, but the lore is not just mythic. It's actually largely true when it posits that every Doom guy in every Doom game is the same guy in different times, in different nightmares. If a Doom game is going to be a Doom game, the first, last, and most important thing is the impression it gives to play it. The original Doom had the enormous fortune of being a mega-hit at the dawn of a whole new entertainment medium. It would be a true classic if it never made another impact in games history again. The beautiful simplicity of Doom, though, made certain that wouldn't be the case. It's going to be remade, again and again and again, decade after decade, because Doom games, if they're working, barely exist outside of the present tense. They're mechanically immersive to the point of blocking out all other stimulus. When they're over, they're memorable, but they leave a craving for more. A Doom sequel or reboot doesn't even have to look forward. Doom Eternal looks backwards as boldly as a tall man facing the wrong way at the front of a crowded elevator. A good Doom sequel just has to fulfill the cravings. The cravings for speed, brutality, spectacular gore, darkly absurdist environments. All in a package that makes you feel exhilarated by how hard the game is trying to kill you. Doom Eternal is a knockout title, but it's itself not eternal. It's got some faddish auxiliary systems and experimental deviations that may or may not pop up in forthcoming Doom games. 
None of that matters in the face of how well it satiates the craving. In another 24 years, there'll be some new Doom, and it'll be as different from Eternal as it is from Doom 64. If it's a good Doom, that won't matter. If it's a good Doom, it'll feel just the same to be the Doom Slayer. In another 24 years, Doom Eternal will still feel like Doom, the same way that Doom 2 still feels like Doom. They are links in the chain, iterations of the same character, a character with no personality beyond the urge to rip and the urge to tear. The ultimate id game, in many more ways than one. As excessively self-flattering to the player as Doom Eternal can be, a mythic frame is the only one that adequately holds the games and their intentions together in a coherent way. Like the Martian scientists of the UAC, the most optimistic projection for Doom as a franchise is that future media historians will unearth some forgotten tablet, look at its oddly helmeted figure, and immediately be able to say, oh, I know that guy. That's the Doom guy. For his are the guts, his is the glory, and his are the power-ups, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for watching. This video, and all the videos I do, are only made possible through the generous support of people currently donating through the crowdfunding website Patreon. I'd like to take a moment to thank by name some of the people who are currently donating $10 a month or more. People like Krimgi Schlepeps, Darius Rudeminer, Liam Pierce, Nikolai Vladimirov, Clea Harrington, Kate Stock, Talia Hunke, Grendel, Shostyu, Gaspard Fleury Hurtubise, Gamp, Greg Recca, Amanda Kay, Samuel Murphy, Justin Michael, Chris Dobbs, Tom Vickers, Robin Mueller, Evan Bartman, The Rambling Bard, Steve Bellegarde, Daria, Armada, Pieface, Ryan Francom, Jeremy Harris, Nate Tenzar, Tom Painter, Simon Yearfalk, Sharif Kazemi, Jared Olszewski, Mr. Flacco, Eric Jackson, Dirk Warbrule, Q Ray X, Alex Zalato, The Bloke, Brandon Boat, Stephen Garrett Day, Sasha Ia, Peter Flink, Jenno Shin, Michael Dimichiel, Matthias Van Den Bosch, Jared Kay, Matthew Allen Kelsey, Victor Nordstrom, Jack Shawhan, Gustav Lindstedt, Grant Kelly Walker, Cole Davies, Thomas Watkins, The Drunken Manatee, Zach B., Lasselis, Codeheart, Thomas Witte, Casey Pioli, Hercules Johnson, The Soul James, Fergus Foley, Argus Swift, Ryan Van Dyke, Daniel Barsh, Saibot D., Kim Winson, Andreas Larson, Anthony Bardill, Sean, Philip Coffey, Brian Fluckelman, Jesse Wilkerson, Devin Fitzpatrick, Tim Marsh, Colin Bassnet, Jeanette N., Carl Gleason, Spooky Space Cook, Dios, Rich Stewart, Adrian Connolly, April, Jacob McMillan, Eric Joyner, Edward Clayton Andrews, Tim Dobbs, Ian Glascock, Dylan Ball, C.E. Keane, Mr. Pigeon, El Weasel, Werner Herzog, Connor McLeod, Daniel Oren Christensen, Thomas Lee, Me, Nemo Vandenbrink, The Nick of Horrors, Ben Weller, J.S., Nick, Greg Merlis, Jordan Klein, Sky Jansen, Daniel Floyd, Mark Phillips, Andrew Tapp, Kevin Schaub, Matthew Sutton, Tizar Vakarian, David Carlson, Kissa, David Hartstreit, Matthew Mason, Josh, Obelisk Art History, Matthew Cassidy, Will Dobbins, Tom Rowerdink, Kyle Zaner, N.K. Jemison, Michael Atwell, Andrew Offinger, I Cannot Fly, Dirk Warbrule, Nicole Hamilton, Galak, Brett Gialmo, Oscar Stangenberg, Lars Ingvar Anderson, Colin, Adam Howard, Dewey, Aurelian, Andrew Boisino, Pascal Murray, Alexander Sundin, Austin Matheson, Scott Mock, SG Response, Tiernan Darsis, Christopher Askin, James Gray, Victor Tumoli, Derek Melencom, Jared A. Hicks, Yara Johnson, Han Jiping, Jacob Mwanish, Valerian, Psychedelicat, Max Cohen, Shieldwall, Leo Peril, Margalat, Tyler F., Piper Man, William Tong, Conceited Axis, Bryn Davies, Lawrence Hurley, James Mosca, Simon Anderson, Victor Felton, S. Engvall, Jeffrey McIntyre, Marcin Zarad, Zachary Berent, Levi Whitney, Dakian Delamast, Mr. Mosh, Nikolai, Elijah Nelson, Sam Bellmeyer, Byron Callan, Colin Guti, Eric Amundsen, Noah Kentrowitz, Tinfoil Pancakes, Max Pantoja, Maurice Desereau, Manu Weedman, 
Lil Bianca, Gillotin, Lance Jordan Falls, Ralph Rainwater, Alexander Romanov, Piotr Kasperzik, Patrick McGranahan, Robot Ghost, Jeremy Saunders, Stephen Heim, Ryan Snyder, Cool Boy John, Atadio Albanese, Ethan Hayes, Howard Knudsen, Quinn Hannah White, Carol Ho, Peter H., Reese Kittleson, John Little, Scrub Lord, Darren Jackson, Eric Jensen, Phil Harden, Elijah King, Baxter Jr., Max Barros, Patrick Galmond, Tyrone Lambert, Gabriel Holland, Simon Hasselow, Patrick Mills, Miesko Zaha, Callum Tien, Bryn Gelbart, Dralax789, Deeb, Highland Fox, Well Tempered Clavier, William Pavard, Quainen, Matthew Shryrock, Dragon Cobalt, Ricky Shields, Asbjorn Vol. <coughs> sorry, Asbjorn Vol Valvian, Galvin? I'm sorry. Owen Tierla, Cold Beans, Bob Mitchum, Tyler King, Mike W., Stephen Lovedance, Benjamin, Ivan Ekaverian, Selwick, Cobra, Adam Nolt, Histoclop, Travis Houston, Alex Williams, William J. Gorman, Marky Marky, Mark, sorry, Marky Marcus Aurelius, Leighton Carbon, James Henderson, Zachary Ziemba, Juju Beans, John Sikowski, Matthew Richard Teubner, Eric Booz, Levi Thomas, Heast Guy, Hedgehog Kevin, Sean Sobey, Doom Sheridan, Jeremy Austin, Cody Patterson, Sophia Naylor, Alexander Smith, Konstantin Ivanov, Ali Hamoud, Franz Lauchter, Devona Uperak, Jed Kirk, Logan Hickman, Danston, Tyson Cox, JRG123, Liam White, Zachary Leonard Roper, Wolf and White Man, Sergeant QQ, Trinet, Penny Drake, Matthew Burns, Symmetry Master, 1MXW1, Aaron Dembski Budin, Matthias Campbell, Rogue Thrax, Keone Warby, Eli Youngs, Space Wizard 63, Army HD, VB, Maxwell Bone, Thomas Vavasur, Emma vs. Dracula, Peter Gronbach, Jay Calder, Tyler R. Smith, Alex McDonald, Ryan Park, Christopher Guile, Kevin Morris, Allison Sugar, Brianna Manassa, Mario Mendez, Dave, Alexander Clatworthy, Vadim Flax, Kyle Zimes, Colin Stoltz, Nicholas, Quinn, Kale Perrion, Comfy Hat, Alex Hansen, Leah O'Neill, Ethan Cossett, John Paul Queller, Aaron Williams, Andrew Hartnett, Zach Millington, Zoe Sheik, Eddie Burton, Carol Henderson, Daniel Phillips, Tyler Robinson, Jeremy McQuaid, Corey Bofill, Eli Bergmatz, Dennis Clark, Jake Mays, Kumaran Vijian, Nobody, World War II Freak, Alexander Leister, Igor Babiuk, Lars Brecken, Morgan Mall, Brian Hill, Julian Reno, Agon Dean, Jared Meyer, Genoshin, Stinson Sneed, Notem, Adam Alla, ICR7, Thomas Culligan, Ali Mortimo, Brian Barrow, Cydonia, Massive Ron, Ron Gervais, James Condon, Gray, Chris Teckington, Evan Eggers, Peori, Vodka Blitz, Kirk Battle, Johnny Marsbar, Rusty Kelly, Jason Hine, Jeff Sang, Jason, Stephen Flobang, and many others who donate a smaller amount. Without you guys, these videos wouldn't happen. I really appreciate it. Thank you.